So uh, hello, hello everybody. So welcome you uh, to this session with an amazing topic, which is Industry 4.0 and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So before we start, I really kindly ask you, you already did it, mute your microphones during the session. Um, you can of course unmute it uh, to uh, paste a question uh, and to uh, make a question. Or you can also uh, just write in the chat the question and we uh, will do the asking later on uh, during the conversation. Joan and I will be uh, looking on the, on the chat room to see if anybody has a question. So you can then choose either to speak uh, and uh, you can even turn on your camera or you can uh, just uh, make us uh, place the question. Then the second part is on the logistics. You can use the three dots uh, on the right upper corner on your image or on the image, for example, of our guest, Diogo. Uh, to enlarge the screen so you can better see uh, him during during our conversation. That would be also useful probably. And the last thing, uh, this session will be recorded. So uh, just that you know, if you don't don't like it to be recorded, uh, it's it's nothing we can do. It's, it it will be recorded and it will be broadcasted afterwards. So on the on the channel. Okay. So. For the people that are already here, I don't know if you know it, but you have been lucky already twice. First, because you did get a seat. Uh, um, not everybody showed up today, but the seats were, were reg uh, restricted, so we had only 40 of them. So you were once lucky to get the seat uh, in the first place. And the second part, um, but because you will really meet a very seasoned uh, professional, Diogo Silveira. And I will just present him now to you so you know who he is and what he does. So Diogo graduated in engineering school, uh, Escol Central de Lille. I don't speak French, I hope I did pronounce that well. He was also a research scholar in Barty UC, and he did his MBA in NCR. Okay. His professional background is even more impressive. As a former McKinsey partner, he is very seasoned CEO. He uh, and the investor and worked in multiple sectors, producing outstanding results for his stakeholders throughout his missions. He worked in retail, telecommunications, financial sector, and the industry sector, which allowed him to gain valuable insight across industry. I think this is probably or has been one of his key elements to his success for breaking records continuously year after year in most of the companies where he worked. Diego had the opportunity to work in nine countries, and he speaks five languages, which is really impressive. I don't know how that is possible, but he does. Today he's an investor and entrepreneur, and he represents EasyCart, an innovative data-driven company with a mission to disrupt retail home delivery services. So Diogo, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and welcome to this round table, and I hope uh, you enjoy this talk as much as I do and Joao and everybody else. Thank you to, for having me here, yes. Yeah, good. So um, the topic is Industry 4.0 and AI. So let's start directly with this topic. So given, given your impressive uh, and wide experience in multiple sectors and industries, as well as geographies, um, you work in nine countries, you've directly experienced the hype around the promise of AI during the 90s and early 2000s, just to see it under-delivered on the promise made. So how do you feel that this time it is different or it's the same? What do you think about it? <clears throat> Very good. So I'll, I'll try to, yes, to, to share my perspective. The, the short answer to your question is that I, I believe uh, it's, it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go for the slightly longer answer, uh, trying to share the, the experience. Um, Yes, I think in the in the in the nineties and even before, there was in a way some mismatch of expectations, uh, because um, people were not clear enough on uh, uh, neither uh, exactly what uh, what uh, AI at that time it was called that way could could only that way could do for them, uh, so it it was not not so easy to 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 do and also. Actually, there was there were not the means to uh, potentially uh, extract value out of that. So, what what do I mean? I mean that uh, to use uh, AI in full, 
you first need to uh, acquire data. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, a little bit still today, we'll come back to that, but 30 years ago, most of the companies would not be able to acquire data, or at least the required data. Mm -hmm. Then uh, when they would be able to acquire it, they would not be able to uh, store it, at least in enough quantities. Uh, then when they would be able to acquire it and to store, most, uh, most of the time they would not be able to process it at the speed such that the uh, usage of all that data will be, will be relevant. And we realize today that... Uh, Lots of historical data, data are relevant, not just, you know, online data. So there was clearly not enough data acquired, not enough data stock, not enough processing capacity. So when, when we tried to do things, it would just uh, take a lot of time. I mean, I, we all remember, I remember when I was a student from time to time, there were some works that we would start at the evening in the computer. Then you would leave a paper on the computer, please don't touch and you would come the next day hoping for no one to touch it and some results to come out. Huh? Today, for lots of those things, you would like in, in, in uh, less than a second to have that outcome. So I think that the, 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 the thing that uh, uh, now makes it completely different uh, is that people first do understand those limitations and therefore understand that they need to uh, acquire data, store data, uh, and, and then of course, there is a lot more processing capacity. We are not yet quite there, but I mean, it's a, a hell of a difference compared to, to 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this time they will be different. Joao, what... Uh... Um, yeah, so our next question will be, uh, that's super interesting because um, also on that topic is that we've seen that, um, um, you know, given the technical complexity of the topics that data science encloses, in the new hype generated that some of us have completed in the early 90s, but uh, there's a new hype around AI and what it can do um, and what it is, what is its true potential. Some of it is obviously true, some of it is obviously overstated, uh, both by media and by some uh, less less uh, ethical promoters, I would say. But um, we, we, we have, have seen in the market, we at Closer, um, to see a kind of a, a mismatch of expectations sometimes between what data science and AI can actually do, um, as well as the result that one can expect at, at each company. And, and, and the, the fact is that very often uh, the results are unknown to us as much as they are to the client. So, so it's not easy to explain that applying a certain algorithm or a certain technique will give you X percent of, of performance improvement or something like that so so that's that, uh, that 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 is a topic so in your opinion what is the adequate approach to these topics um, from a, a corporate stand, standpoint so industry 4.0 AI machine learning and how have you done so uh, in your many management roles hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, I, I think um, there's uh, there's some parallel thinking we can do with uh, AI and data science uh, these days and, uh, you know, uh, IT uh, 40 years ago, you know. Uh, it was not always clear up front what it could, what it could bring exactly. We could feel that it, uh, that it would bring something, but very often you would learn uh, by doing it as it, as it, did, as it did come. So, the first thing that is needed is some, some vision. You need, to, you need to believe in it. You need to be able to uh, uh, take some risks, uh, to launch initiatives, accepting that some initiatives will work out and others will, will, will not, because it is not obvious to exactly know what you, you will do. So in one, of the, in one of my most recent experiences, that was exactly the point. Uh, that was a little bit of vision uh, among the, the leadership, but we were not clear in which areas it would be the most relevant. So we launched several parallel initiatives yeah. in such, uh, I mean, in, in many different areas, trying to uh, look at uh, supply chain, predictive maintenance, uh, 
forestry management, so completely different uh, areas. And uh, clearly we did uh, several pilots and some did work out well, others did work out uh, less, uh, in a less interesting way. And uh, so the first thing I would say is, is some vision, some willingness to take risks, to be early adopters. Because as we know, in, in many of those areas, you can then, you know, take a, a very big, big advantage. One, one of the topics is what, what has made the difference in the experiences that have worked out better than others. And one of the things is, uh, it, it's, it's very basic because this looks very complex, but it, it's not. You just get lots of data, lots of data, and you work on the data. So if you don't have enough data, that's a lot more difficult. Yeah. If the quality of your data is not uh, good enough, then you can also, you know, not work uh, a lot, uh, a, a lot, a lot on it. So very often when you, the advantage of being among the early adopters is that you get as a feedback to yourself, watch out, look at the quality of your data. So go back, go back and now and work on different ways of capturing the data. Uh, check out, double check on the quality of your data. You, you, for very, there's lots of data, you never used it, so no one ever checked whether the quality of the data was okay. But when you then work it through, uh, uh, through AIs and algorithms, then you get a, a very clear understanding of whether the data is okay or, or, or not. So one of the feedbacks you do get is, is, is clearly that, that one. But it seems, you know, just to be very, very basic. So combination of some vision and then uh, going back to having just enough data, uh, being able to, to store it and, and to use it. Then it's very easy. You just put it in a black box. And then there are companies like, like yours that, that do manufacture, quote unquote, those black boxes. And that, but of course, if, if you put garbage in the black box, garbage comes out of the black box. <laughs> in the black box. Then, so you don't need to understand the, the way the black box uh, works or runs. At least I, I, I don't. But you need to understand that. Uh, of course, uh, namely for some processes, those that are more predictive, that you can uh, leverage on, uh, on historical data, it will, it will help. I mean, even for fund management, you know, the fund managers, they always say, watch out, historic performance is not a good indicator of future performance. Wrong. <laughs> it is a good indicator. But you need to have lots of data and you need to get the right black box. So, yeah. but that in a way, it, it was very similar also to what we looked at 40 years ago. I was uh, already not a teenager anymore, 40 years ago. And when we looked at IT, we were also not very clear. We just understood that we would be able to do things better, faster. And, uh, and something that I think will also uh, come with, uh, with this phase now is that you are able to rethink your process. This enables you to introduce new processes. Eh? If we think about IT 40 years ago, initially, let's just, uh, let's just you know, put uh, uh, systems in this process. Let's just make it uh, uh, you know, more digital in a way. But that was not the best approach. The best approach, let's take a chance now and rethink the process given that I have new means. With AI, it's just exactly the same idea. It's not trying to do things better and faster. No, it's enabling you to do things different, hopefully for the better, but different, which is a different concept. So you have to be willing to try and do things differently, not just more of the same. Well, great. That's that, that. Yeah, that, that for sure is a is a great um, great experience. Given that you've seen both 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 things in action, and it's it's it is not easy. And we see a lot. We see a lot in 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 our experience that uh, the explainability issue is a very strong issue. So having being able to explain what's happening in the model, especially if the model is giving out or the outcomes are less intuitive or they tell you to do things in a very different way from what you've been doing instead of marginal improvements on your process. They're telling you to do, look, turn this thing inside out and make it, like, spin it around and do it completely different. 
and if you can't always explain it, it's quite hard to, to, to believe in the model. Even for us, that made the model. <laughs> we, only, if you, only if you use it, then you'll see if it works or not. But it's, it's super interesting, your, your answer. Thank you. Thank you, Diogo. Um, so you said, uh, of course, it's not only just to do the, to, to do the things uh, smarter and faster, but really to stop and rethink maybe an, an entire sector or maybe an uh, entire, de let's say, department or, or area of intervention. So um, we, we have closed. We have, uh, we have seen interesting results in that regard coming from applying data science um, to advanced optimization issues, uh, let's say, such as uh, intelligent task prioritization, uh, case management, production optimization, even logistics and delivery, among others. So uh, to go into these areas and to try to stop rethink and sometimes just to make things easier and faster and sometimes really to reinvent them. So on that note, um, can you please talk a little bit about your new endeavor? Um, of course, uh, you talk about whatever is possible to talk about. It's easy card, um, and what uh, extent are you using data science to improve the business proposition? What is the business about? What is the whole concept, the story? How 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 are you disrupting uh, uh, the, the delivery the delivery uh, services? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the, I would say that the the first the most relevant thing in the end uh, ends up always being uh, what you can achieve. So the impact you can achieve uh, with what you're doing. So uh, this, 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 uh, this uh, approach that we now have, the, what is the most relevant is the way it will impact the way uh, consumers uh, get the their e-commerce orders at, uh, at big food retailers delivered to them and uh, the the approach we have and uh, that is uh, entirely data science dependent so it, it, it and i will come back to that but first i think it's relevant to understand what what the impact the impact we can have the impact we will have is that um we will be able to deliver same day for the orders that will come we'll be able to deliver with uh, uh, slots very narrow one hour within one hour slots we will be able to deliver with an sla 10 percentage points above the current uh, average and a couple of other features but those are some of the key features for the consumers and the only way we will be able to to do that is because we fully leverage data science so without data science it would just not be possible so here is something where it's not that data science is going to help is that uh, data science is is a sine qua non approach why mm -hmm. because uh, we will be leveraging an algorithm that has just been developed exactly fit to purpose and that algorithm will be all the time computing and based on lots of data real time to understand what's the what's the best task prioritization and uh, not only i mean in in the logistics but also before the logistics mm -hmm. the ordering the, the packing the delivering and all those tasks will be prioritized and that will be only possible because real time will be uh, acquiring lots of data, stocking that data and working on that data uh, without data science uh, as it is today, we just would not be able because we would have the van that will be delivering. Oh, now stop, they are computing. Let's put the paper on the van. I come back to see when I can now do the next delivery. So it's, <laughs> it's uh, but, but real time, we, we believe we, the, the leverage of data science for you to get a feel, we don't believe that this will help us do, say, in the same amount of time, do five of te or 10% more deliveries within the same time frame as, as it does happen today. Our target is to do double. So 
This is the type of things when I say you need to rethink the process. It's not doing it a little bit better. So we believe the approach we have that is completely data science uh, dependent will enable us to uh, do double the deliveries in the same amount of time and then be able, therefore, to pass on all these uh, these uh, benefits to the, to the consumer, as I said, you know, same day, one hour slot, and more than 95% uh, uh, SLA. And without uh, the, 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 the capacity today to uh, acquire all the data, to stock it, to work on it, to do predictions before, and then real time to recompute all the time, uh, one of the approaches is, 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 is very, is, is at the same time unbelievably exciting and completely stupid. It just computes all the potential possibilities. If you have 100 deliveries, let's say, to do, first the first one, then the second, then the third, or first, <laughs> second, 25. To, so just, just it, so it's, it's, it's very basic. That's why I say data science is very basic. So one of the approaches, one of the algorithms that one could use, just compute all the possibilities. But of course, for that, you need huge capacity of stockage and of processing so that that happens within, uh, in real time. So um, that's, uh, that's why we are so excited about this new endeavor. Very, very it's basic. Yeah, very, very interesting. I mean, you said, yeah, data science is really easy. I, I mean, I love when, when a customer, when a customer says something like that, because that means that uh, our company or the data scientists among us were able to get all the complexity, challenge it and, and leave it in-house, let's say, and then present just the simple truth uh, to the end customer and say, yeah, look, it's basically, uh, I get all the possibilities on a list in real time. That's it. It's basic. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you know that's sometimes uh, it's uh, yes we all we all have to uh, to speak uh, each other's language each other's language and very often what we do have in, in the companies is that the uh, the technology department or you know IT system and today with the AI area they will focus a bit too much sometime on the technology uh, the others that uh, are in the marketing area and the strategy area, they only think about the consumer and the profitability. And when they talk, they do not always understand each other. And um, so I think, but it's, it's, it's not uh, the responsibility of one team, the non-technological team or the, the technological team. It's, you, you have to have them communicate in a reasonable way so that the first one is clear on what he or she really needs. And the technology says, you know, what he or she can really do. And uh, very often there is, there, they don't understand each other, not always well enough, let's say. So, but when they do it, it's, 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 this is very basic, huh? very basic. Yeah. Diego, this reminds me, this reminds me of, a, of a story that you shared uh, in the previous conversations we had, uh, how, you, how you as a CEO and since all those different directors report to you and they talk his or her language, what is your strategy on, on, on getting them to, to learn and to, to see how, how the other department is working? So, okay, yeah, I think that was very, very interesting on, on your side. Can you share that, please? Sure, I will share, but it's, it's, it's again very basic. Eh? <laughs> you, you just, you just uh, take them and completely change their, their, their position and their responsibility. So, in, yes, in, it's true that in one of the last companies I, I, I was in, uh, the, 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 the guy that was formerly uh, uh, chief accounting, so he was in charge of uh, accounting, I suggested that he would go and uh, manage the, the, the forest. <laughs> then I asked the guy that was, uh, that was buying wood, I told him, why don't you go and sell paper in Europe? <laughs> it's almost the same. <laughs> and uh, the guy that was in charge of uh, marketing of the uh, paper products, I told him, why don't you go and, and buy wood? Because the guy that buy wood now is uh, selling paper, so it's, it's empty. <laughs> so I, I am very much of the belief that we, uh, we learn uh, a lot uh, 
of course, by, by listening, but a lot more by doing. And uh, a lot of what we need to do to be successful in a position, a lot is common, is shared among, among positions as soon as you have some leadership position. So to experience different perspectives not only enhances your overall knowledge, but you then understand much better the benefits and the interest of working with the others, of why they ask you things, why, why they are unhappy about, about something. You know, uh, if, you, if you did not experience some others' uh, problems, it's a lot tougher to understand them. So nothing better than, than, than to go there. And uh, I mean, of course, not everyone can cope with such moves. So you have to choose those who do it. But then all of a sudden, it has lots of benefits in a company. The first benefit is, of course, for the, the persons that get that opportunity. They completely have a new vision of the world. Can you imagine when your world is in an office doing accounting and all of a sudden now you are working in, in, in the forest and trying to understand how to grow things better, faster. It's just completely different. It worked out pre extremely well. Then the second benefit is that, of course, next time you, need, you, 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 you talk to the accountant about the way he should take into account what you've been doing in the forest, <laughs> of course, it's much easier for you to, to relate. And last but not least, because in life, those things always end up about motivating people. Everyone then in the company understood that, that everything was possible. Because before, when I was in a department, my opportunity, if I want to grow, was to get my boss's job. Now I can get also the boss of my friend's job and of the other friend, because I can move to the side and not only through my own ideas. So uh, it's... Uh, this helps uh, question the way things are done. And uh, uh, when you are very successful and the company is very successful, it's even more difficult to question. It's just like in a, also in a, in a soccer team. Right? When the soccer team wins, you try not to change the people. That, that's wrong. It's when it's going well that you need to introduce some more that will learn with those that are very successful. So to go for AI and to and data science, which implies, you know, questioning the way you, you do things, it's good to try to have such, a, such an open culture. Uh, otherwise, you will always be a, a follower. And very seldom in life, companies that have led in one cycle are the ones that have led in other cycles. And we all know names of companies that were extremely successful for many years, but then some others did come. What is difficult is for the companies to reinvent themselves and data science, machine learning, AI, the way you want to call it, give an opportunity to all the companies to reinvent themselves. But you have to be open to that. And you have to take some risks. And, uh, and if you foster a culture that, uh, that enables that, it's, of course, much easier. Great, great. Before I, before I pass the word to João, uh, just to our audience, uh, this, this, and not only this, but this strategy of cross cross uh, uh, function of, of directors uh, helped the last company to break three uh, the records of revenue and all uh, find important indicators three times in a row so it's not a crazy vision it really helped the company to become better and better and i think it's it's partly responsible for that as well so uh, it did work and it's important to get to know the other to listen like you said and uh, and to understand the language and uh, to to see how the world outside our little box works, how it works in the other box. Great, Jean. Um, yeah. No, on that on that note, I would just like to add that having worked as a as a consultant for many clients in, in several industries, I would like to for that to be also a possibility sometimes that a client would come and help me do what he was asking me to do in, in that time span. So I think that would generate a lot of empathy <laughs> among consultants and clients. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, no, but for sure, I mean, even in, even in our company, we see that different areas in different business, especially between you know, front office and back office, there's a lot of misconceptions about what the other guys are doing and what they can do. And so I guess, I mean, your what you've shared is super important for sure. Um, Right, so another little change of topic. So we know, so we have seen a lot also the wide use application on, on, um, of data science in forecasting models. I mean, it's a very, it's, it's something that's been going on in the industry for quite some time. You know, many industries have great forecast models. Data science has, has been able to, 
to improve those forecasting models quite a lot. Even I guess that in your new endeavor, you also have you know you, you're using also for a real-time forecasting model, which you know recent um, you know as you said, processing power and new algorithms have been made very very accurate and then working very well and adapting each second by new information that they deliver. Um, but we also have seen that in many companies there is a clear distinction between there's a failure in making the distinction between a, a demand forecast model and a sales forecast model. Um, and what we mean by this is sometimes that people just tend to take their internal data and look at their own box and universe to make forecasts based that already that data is based on their own biases and what they're selling to the market. So, and the demand forecast is a different type of model. And also, a sales forecast also bears in mind your um, your restrictions, your production restrictions or delivery restrictions or whatever. And so, do, do you agree? I mean, I'm making the statement obviously, but <laughs> do you agree that uh, they are different? Um, and how do you see that making this this distinction is important in applying data science um, and and ultimately can have an impact um, in, in your industry? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I mean, it, it's of course uh, very different uh, to to do. Uh, 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 demand forecasting and sales forecasting, uh, unless you're in a monopoly. Of course, that is an opportunity <laughs> where it's just the same. I have not worked in any monopoly, so. Uh, but uh, when I was a when I was a consultant, because I also spent some time in consulting, I remember having a, a, a client that only uh, came to us and he only had sales forecast, no 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 demand forecast, and of course he had a very a very positive view of the way uh, sales would be developing. And we, 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 we then did some uh, demand forecasting and we realized that five years down the road, he, he would already have a, a market share slightly above 100%, which is <laughs> quite uncommon. So, of course, yes, I think that demand forecasting is, 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 is of course, crucial because it's the context. Eh? It's mm -hmm. uh, something that you can impact, of course, because well, if you're a serious please. player, you can also impact the, the, the demand but it's the first thing we need to understand. And it has so much data that it's clearly one of the areas uh, where, uh, where data analysis uh, comes into play and allows you to yeah, do something, uh, something uh, uh, yeah. more serious. In some markets where supply demand, like commodity markets, where supply demand are very relevant, it's also interesting to try to do some uh, supply forecasting. Because, for instance, if you're in a market where your forecast for the demand is that the demand goes down, I don't know, 1% a year, it might seem a problem unless you see that the supply forecast says that supply forecast goes down 2%. Then even engineers like me understand that if demand goes down 1% and supply goes down 2%, prices could go up even though demand goes down. So clearly demand forecasting is, is crucial. And it's a very strong input for the sales forecast because there are lots of topics that are completely structural and then operationally to move to move share in an organic way is, is very difficult and you can get it wrong so you always need to start thinking from outside in and outside is the demand sales is, is inside so it's very clear that in all sectors you should try to start with uh, demand forecasting Interesting. Uh, uh, taking on on your PAX experience as well. So you you work for obviously Navigator, um, w where you have to make long term investment decisions, but forecast can change. Well, not very abruptly. I, I don't know actually if ever maybe it changes abruptly or not at some points. But but that I I guess that your comment on commodities maybe made me think about that relationship because in commodities it's pretty much the same. So. For you to take an oil well to production, it takes like, I don't know, 10 years lead time before finding it, developing it. So when you make your initial decision, like your demand forecast may be completely out of date when you're making an investment on a 10 or 20 years kind of lifespan. So how do you, how did you approach that, if that makes sense, in, 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 that, in that experience or others, that mismatch between investment period and, and, um, and demand shift? I mean, it, w when you have lots of data about the market, not just about yourself, if you have lots of data about the market through associations and things like that, you are able to have, you know, 
a very solid set of data. So to forecast, I don't know, you know, uh, up to two to three years down the road is is in a quantitative way is reasonable because the 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 the, uh, the range of options are reasonably uh, narrow. Eh? And, and again, if you have lots of data, you, you work on it, and it's 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 reasonably uh, narrow. Uh, there are other topics where forecasting is a lot tougher, as as, as you know, in, in weather forecasting, you know. <laughs> the, it's always no, but you know why? Because the, you know the, the mathematic model, uh, as we uh, as we say, forgets the initial conditions. So the range of options very soon is very open. So there, even with huge data science, it's still very difficult to to forecast forty eight hours. But in many industries that are reasonably uh, stable, if you have lots of data, two to three years, you can do. But what you cannot do um, is five, ten years in a quantitative way, your, your potential of error increases a lot. So you need to go for something that is much more complex to me than, than data science, which is qualitative studies. Eh? <laughs> you need to go and talk to people, understand behaviors, understand how the generation will think in, in 10 years from now, in 20 years from now. And I did that in some of the companies I work for. So you then have, you know, psychologists and behavior oriented people and that's a lot more tough you know to, to 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 do this but the very long term approach you need to to add a qualitative layer to to quantitative you know data science is fantastic but it has a, it has a, a maximum that it can predict so it's it's fantastic it's huge but luckily we are still needed to put a layer of art and of uh, feeling on top of, of it. Otherwise, it would be only machines. Because the big difference to me of what, what data science enables us to do is it enables machines to make the decisions instead of us, you know. Machines decide what is the level of priority of the tasks in many areas, not any more uh, human. So, uh, but that that's okay if you forecast a little, you know, not too far ahead. If it goes further ahead, we are back into play.